Last week we looked at the first half of an important phrase for us as a church in this community. The beginning phrase of that is, come as you are. Kind of a simple thing, but really not all that easy sometimes. Being a come as you are community. We want to be a church that is a safe place for you to be who you are. That it's okay for you to be unique and to let your uniqueness shine through. Because we're all people under innovation. God's always working on all of us. We're going to care more about being good as opposed to looking good. We believe that life happens in community. So we're going to strive to be a community that's exclusively an inclusive community. Where we're always open. We're always receiving people in just like their family. To be able to have an environment like this, we have to have an atmosphere and an attitude of acceptance. This idea of acceptance is the state of receiving someone into a relationship. Receiving someone into that relationship, the good and the bad, but receiving the whole person. But acceptance does not mean that we agree with their behavior. Acceptance does not say that what you do, the choices you make, we agree with all those things. Acceptance is loving them despite those things. Loving them anyway. No prerequisites. There are no prerequisites. No, there's nothing that you have to accomplish before you can come and be accepted into this community. It's a community that you will always be accepted into. I love the phrase that James makes in the book of Acts in chapter 15 when he comes and he he makes the judgment for the early church and he makes this statement. He says that we should not make it difficult for people who are turning to God. We should not make it difficult. You can see we're a, a people that's really good at the difficult. We don't think anything easy is really true. It's kind of those things, you see the signs that say free, and you're like, yeah, where's the fine print? Where's the catch? Because nothing is free, right? So how can we totally just accept someone in and look past what they've done? I'm not saying we create an environment that's not safe. I'm not saying we allow people to be with kids that shouldn't be with kids. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying be stupid. Because quite frankly, that's what that is. I'm saying we be accepting of people. We be loving towards people. So this week we look at the end of that phrase. The end of the phrase. But before that, I want to look at a couple of passages that I think are important that Paul points out in Ephesians and in Philippians. It's kind of his prayer for the people that he's speaking to. The first one comes from Ephesians 1, 13 through 19. He says, And you also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. 
I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparable great power for us who believe. And then Philippians 1, 9 through 11 says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I don't know about you, but when when I read these things, when I hear what Paul is saying to the people of Ephesus and to the people of Philippi, the thing that I keep hearing is so that you may know him better. Better meaning that there's a point right now where you're at, and I want you to go further. Then he says that your love may abound more and more. There's a place for growth. There's a place for you to grow in your love more and more. What I hear Paul saying is come as you are, just don't stay that way. Come as you are, but just don't stay that way. You see, but as people and part of a church we only tend to hear the first part of that phrase. Come as you are. Because when you hear people get angry and leave the church, I thought you were a come as you are church. I thought you guys were an accepting church. We are. But you can't forget the last part of the phrase. Just don't stay that way. You see, the expectation is come as you are, but you're not going to stay where you were. You're going to grow in your faith. If you don't have any faith, hopefully you're pursuing faith. But there should always be a moment where you can look back and say, I'm not the same that I was. There's something about me that has changed. So this morning, I want us to look at three vital aspects to help us understand this idea of not just staying the way that we were, but moving forward, growing in our faith. And the first one is we need to have a picture of what maturity is. We need to have an idea of what maturity is. Today, I have on my high school class ring, I haven't worn it in... Um, ever Um, and I have it on because one it makes a good point but two Kaylin um, I had to pull it out to show Kaylin because Kaylin is now getting ready to be in the second semester of his ninth grade year so he he's interested in a class ring and, and so we pulled it out and we looked at it a little bit but then as I'm thinking about the message that I'm preparing and I'm thinking you know it would have been really stupid if I would have stayed the same way I was when I was in high school. Could you imagine right now if we were all the same maturity level that we were when we were in high school? Could you, you think this president, presidential campaign was a disaster. You, could you imagine what our country would be like if we were all the maturity we were in high school? It would be a train wreck. And so when I saw my class ring, I started thinking, you know, it's like, you know, high school is just a kind of a stop for a moment and move on. It was a period in my life, but I was never meant to stop there. I was meant to continue in my growth. I was meant to continue in my maturity. Paul says it this way. In 1 Corinthians 13, 11, he says, When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Do you see that? 
You see, it's okay to be an infant spiritually. But we were never meant to stay there. We were always meant to grow in our faith. You were always meant to grow in your faith. You know, it's kind of the idea at some point you have to learn to feed yourself. You can't rely on other people to feed you. You can't rely always on people to give you the answers, to look things up for you. You've got to take it upon yourself to grow in your faith. If you never do it yourself, you're always expecting someone else to feed you. How far will you actually grow in your faith? So what is the goal or the picture of maturity as a Christ follower? What is the goal? Well, Jesus tells us in Matthew 22, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's our goal. Anybody accomplish that one yet? No, we'll forever be working on that one. I've said it before, you know, take your Bible, go home, rip out that section and focus on that one. When you got that, move on to the rest. That's the most important thing. That's our goal and our maturity is to have all of our being loving Christ. Everything we do is about Christ and his love for us and our love for him and to love the people around us as Christ loves them. So how do we do this? How do we achieve such a lofty goal? Well, Jesus tells us that answer too. In John chapter 15, verse five, he says, I, Jesus, am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, Jesus, you can do nothing. We cannot tend to separate ourselves from the vine and expect to grow. We have to be connected to Jesus. That's the only way that we're going to grow. But the thing is, we tend to have at least moments or periods in our life where we disconnect from the vine and expect to grow. But this isn't anything new Because Paul even addressed this to the people in Galatia when he wrote his letter to the Galatians in in chapter 3, verse 3. He said, are you so foolish after beginning by the means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by the means of the flesh? When you came to faith in Christ, you were trying to do things through the Holy Spirit. You were trying and seeking to grow in your faith by being connected to the vine. But now you seem to get off track. And now you're trying to do things in your own power. If you don't think this is true, just go to the local bookstore. Probably not here, but in Muncie or Marion, go to find a bookstore. And I guarantee you, you'll find a big section that says self help. If you want to know what an oxymoron is, go read a self-help book. It doesn't work. You can't expect your broken self to fix your broken self. It doesn't work. We have to be connected to the vine. When have you ever seen the branch turn into a vine once it separates from the vine? It doesn't. What does it do? It dies. It dies when it's separated from Christ. If your faith is not connected to Christ, you won't grow in your faith. The second one. The the context of relationships. This is an important aspect of not staying where you are. The relationships. John Townsend and Henry Cloud say this about connection. At the emotional level, connection is the sustaining factor for the psyche, the heart, and the spirit. Virtually every emotional and psychological problem from addictions to depression has alienation and emotional isolation at its core or close to it. 
when we distance ourselves from people and we isolate ourselves and we try to do life on our own and we disconnect from the people around us and, and we separate ourselves from community, we're setting ourselves up for failure. We were created to be in community with each other. If you don't believe that, just look at your God. From the very beginning, we see, and even in Genesis 1, that God says, let us create. Do you think he was talking to his imaginary friend? No. Jesus existed the Holy Spirit existed even at the beginning of creation. God literally lives in community. He creates out of community. He functions as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in community among his people. Everything flows out of community. And we were created to live in that community with one another. We need each other. In Colossians 2, 19, Paul again, speaking to the church of Colossae, says, They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and its, whatever that word is, um, grows as God causes it to grow. I can pronounce all kinds of Hebrew words, but I don't know I have a clue what that one is. Whatever it is, you guys got it. They've lost connection with the head. They've lost a connection with the community that they were meant to be a part of. We were always meant to be connected. A community and in relationships, we should find that love and support and encouragement with one another. And I realized the importance of relationships. How many of you are runners? How many of you like to run? How many of you like to watch people run? Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, how many of you say, I'm never going to do that again in my life? It was a one and done thing. You know, like those commercials. That was my first and my last marathon, all in one, you know, type of thing. But I realized something as a runner. Running by yourself is horrible. I can run like a third of the distance. But if I have someone running with me, I don't think about all my aches and pains. I think about keeping up with the person next to me. I think about just running. I don't think about the things that typically I think about when I'm all by myself, doing it all by myself. But see, the same thing applies to us spiritually. We all need running partners when it comes to our faith. We need people that are beside us, that are walking through our faith journey with us, that we're challenging each other to grow in our faith. People who won't let you be satisfied where you are in your faith. I challenge you to find running partners. And no, you don't have to go out and run with them. But they're there to help you grow. They're not going to be satisfied. They're not going to let you just stay where you are. They're going to challenge you to move forward. Henry Cloud, in his, his new book that he um, just came out with, I've been reading it lately, and it's, it's pretty, pow pretty powerful stuff. Um, the book is The Power of the Other. And, and, and he says this. It's kind of written a little bit towards leadership and business um, aspects but it totally applies to this as well so listen to this business marriage friendships teams culture health and lot in life likewise demand all three the, the three that he's referring to is caring honesty and results so all of those things demand all three of those it says we must be open and trained to receive the feedback Listen to it and take it in so as to develop self-control that leads to great performance. You will never get to the next level if you can't embrace feedback about your performance at the current level. Executive coach Marshall Goldsmith 
puts it aptly in the title of one of his books. What got you here won't get you there. Getting to the next level happens only when you are open to feedback and know how to use it. Moreover, it happens only when you're actually getting feedback. When someone is telling you the truth, we can't change what we do not know we need to change. How do you get feedback? You have other people around you giving it to you, right? How much feedback can you give yourself and it actually be valuable? I try it a lot and I tend to get the same results that I've already gotten. But when we get feedback from other people, when we open ourselves up to allowing people to speak into our life, and we seek to grow from it and, and listen to it and learn from the truth that they're speaking, we'll grow in our faith. The last one, personal development path. A personal development path. It's pretty much meaning intentionally taking the next step in your faith journey. If you never take a step outside of where you are in your faith, you will never grow. More than likely, what happens, and this happens in business world, this happens in church, culture, society, it happens all over the place. When you grow to a certain point, if you stop there and you plateau, there's only one way you go next, and it's down. You never grow out of plateau. You always go down. When you stop growing is the moment you start dying. Did you get that? That's some pretty powerful stuff. If you stop growing, you've started dying. Anybody looking forward to dying? Nobody. And, and I'm, I get the whole idea we all want to go to heaven. I'm, I mean, yes, we do. That's, I mean, that's why we're here, right? But we really don't want to die, right? We want to live our life to the fullest. Until that moment, we don't want to die. But yet, if we stopped growing, we've already started dying. Another one of the values that we have as a church is what we've just simply called contribute. We're not going to be spiritual consumers. We're going to be spiritual contributors. But listen, the spiritual contributors are for the people who are here. They're, you're in the just don't stay that way. But there is a period of time where it's okay to be a spiritual consumer and that's the moment you come as you are. It's okay to borrow a person's God for a little bit. Kind of like the story I told you last week about the guy at the, the addictions group. He said, I need to fire that God because his wasn't the right one. What am I supposed to do if I fire my God and his friend tells him, you can borrow mine? Some of us, we need to piggyback off of someone else's faith for a little bit until we can get to a place where we can walk on our own. And we can begin to take those next steps in our faith. Think about a child. What does a child need in order to get from place to place when they can't walk? They need their parents, right? They need someone to lift them up and carry them. The same is true for our faith. There's people in our life to carry us to a point where we can grow in our own power. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 7, he says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who 
who makes things grow. So ultimately, who makes things grow? God. So who makes you grow in your faith? You think it's a trick question. God. God allows you, he helps you grow in your faith. But, here's the catch. He can only help those who are willing to let him. You have to take the step to allow God to be able to help you. You have to put your faith in him. And it's God who makes your faith grow. But I don't know about that. I, I, I'm not too sure about that whole spiritual gifts thing that the pastor keeps talking about. I, I, I don't know what those are. I, so you distance yourself from them. I don't have a magic wand that I'm going to wave over you and say, you're now empowered to go do this. All I have the ability to do is help you see, like Paul did to the early church, these are your gifts. Use them. I can help you find them, and I can encourage you to use them, and I can empower you to use them, but I can't help you grow in them. Only God can help you grow. But if you never step out and say, I'm willing to use the gifts God has given me, you will never know what God can do in you and through you. You will never see the fullest potential of those gifts come to fruition if you never step out in faith and allow God to help you grow. But we see ourselves in the moment where we are and we say, no, I'm not like that. But Paul, just like Timothy, he saw something great in Timothy that Timothy didn't see in himself. And it took Paul calling it out of Timothy before Timothy realized what God wanted to use him for. We have to step out in faith. And we have to allow God to help us to grow in our faith. In the coming months, we're getting ready to go into, obviously, the Christmas season. We're going to do a series called Unwrapped. We're going to talk about some of the gifts that tend to be left under the tree on Christmas. And then in January, just to give you a heads up, I'm going to do something that I don't like. I don't like resolutions. I don't like New Year's resolutions, but I'm actually going to ask you to make four of them this year. As a church, I'm going to ask every one of you, including myself, to make four resolutions. I'm not going to tell you what they are because you won't come in January. But four really kind of simple things that we can do to grow in our faith, to, to expand where we are, to go beyond where we are, to go to places where we never imagined that God would ever take us or God could ever do in us and through us. But it all starts with four simple little things.